Welcome, dear friends. I hope the meditation session was a good preparation for the next part of the program, namely the panel discussion on this convention theme, Living in the Now, Challenges of the Inner Life. And we have today with us four very fine panelists and theosophists, which I would like to introduce to you one by one. First, uh, we have Maria Jao Figuera, who was born in Portugal in 1961. As a chemical engineer specializing in climate and atmospheric environment, she has been working for the past 30 years for the Portuguese government and the European Union, representing Portuguese authorities in the areas of industry control, environment and natural resources policy. Having a first contact with the Portuguese Theosophical Society at age 17, she has since then pursued studies in various areas of theosophical interest, Eastern and Western religions, mythology, psychology, and science. As a member of the Portuguese Theosophical Society, she facilitates the work of two groups, one lodge, Boa Vantage, since 2009, and the study group called Hermes since 2017. Happy to welcome you to the panel discussion, Maria Joao. Next, we have, of course, someone we all already know, Patrizia Moschin Calvi, who joined the TS in Italy at age of 20. Since 1995, she works as a full-time volunteer in the General Secretariat of the Italian section. She's currently in charge of the editorial staff of the Revista Italiana di Teosofia and is also one of the translators for the magazine. And she's also a member of the editorial committee of the Italian Theosophical Publishing House. She has a number also of international offices, amongst which member of the council and the executive committee of the Theosophical Society in Italy, but also elected member to the executive committee of the European Federation of Theosophical Societies. And she was also appointed a council member in the Council of the International Theosophical Center in Narden. And on top of all that, sort of cherry on the cake, she's also an additional member to the International General Council, and she was elected to that position in 2017. No need to say, but we do it anyway, Patricia gives lectures in Italy as well as abroad. Welcome, dear Patricia. Next, we have Diana van Vloten, and we are very happy to count her among our panelists. Diana is a member of the Arjuna Lodge in Barcelona, Spain, and this she is since 2005. She is a third generation theosophist as both her parents met for the first time during the European World Congress held in Monte Catini in 1952. During her early childhood, her family used to go every year to Zanen, Switzerland, where they would gather to listen to Krishnamurti. So we have here someone who has theosophy in her DNA. Wonderful. Very fine to have you with us, Diana. And then last but not least, the sole gentleman among us. Vipin Shah. Vipin Shah was born in 49, if I am correct, and has lived 50. most of his life in Kenya. It was 1950, Vipin? Yes. Okay, sorry. So in 1950. Yes. Having lived so most of his life in Kenya, he qualifies himself as a businessman with a strong background in science. Reading is his main hobby with history, philosophy, economics, geopolitics, and science as his preferred reading subjects. 
For the last 10 years, he has given several talks at the Nairobi Theosophical Hall on various the esoteric, religious, philosophical, and scientific topics. He has, however, a special interest in reading Buddhist philosophy interpreted by Nagarjuna. And Vipin has as a favorite magazine, The Economist, but I do hope, Vipin, that you are also a keen reader of The Theosophists. <laughs> anyway, <I do> read. <laughs> a very warm welcome in Thank you. the panel for today. Thank and we are very, very glad much. that you all agreed to participate in this panel discussion. And I guess that by now all the uh, audience are very impatient to hear your answers on the different questions that we prepared for this panel in connection with today's subject and this uh, convention subject. So we dive now right away into the subject. And I would like to invite first Maria Zhao to uh, give her views on the very first question, which is this. Where do inner challenges come from? Maria Zhao, please. I think that um, everyone aims to achieve an, an internal equilibrium, um, a state of happiness, um, least but not last. Um, some of us or some people who want to understand what is the meaning of uh, one's life. Every time we have a glimpse of our internal being, our self or our body, every time we take contact with our superior being, a window is opened and then we may understand what lies uh, beneath our, our outer world, our everyday world, and a world that is most of the time centered in stress, uh, tension. And um, there's an insatisfaction that may drive us to try to better understand where do our, um, our a strength and weakness lie and where do they come from to understand exactly our what mechanisms uh, do we do we have that um, control our actions and the way we uh, relate uh, with each other sometimes I think that um, what drives us might be um, an outer event um, that that shakes us, or as as coronavirus, uh, for instance, uh, it's it's very present in the in the last uh, a few a few months, um, almost two years, um, by by the way, and um, there come. Uh, probably an inner insatisfaction um, with the way we feel, the way we act. And um, this drives us to change. This drives us to, 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 to find ourselves uh, in a different way. And we look at people, we look at ourselves, we look at our environment with a, a different perspective. Um, there are different ways that people may be moved to, to change, some are external, but I think that there's a, an intense um, internal um, power inside us that drives us to, to change sometimes. Okay, um, I guess this sounds like this was what you wanted to share. Uh, I don't know. Um, Patricia, um, do you have any reaction to that? Because we got a few interesting questions there. If you could unmute uh, Patricia. 
Yes. Yes, Maria, mm, I, I, I would like to add that even evil, which uh, Blavatsky defines as a necessity, uh, one of the supporters of the manifested universe can contribute to raise questions in men, that questions that can lead to progress, to evolution, so that, uh, again, to quote uh, Blavatsky, men can uh, live uh, forever. And uh, also the growth of self-awareness, this sense of responsibility that uh, originates from it, uh, can leave, lead men to be uh, more involved. And uh, uh, I like to portray this uh, as the um, white lotus that opens up in the moonlight, like the soul that feels the call of the light and opens up perfectly confident to the authentic spiritual life. Thank you, Patricia. Diana, would you have something as a reaction to what you have uh, already heard? Um, about this question, uh, every reincarnation is a big opportunity to advance in our process of inner growth with a growing inner understanding. The situations that we find ourselves in are all there to help us to wake up, to get more and more aware of our inner life. We have to learn steadily to understand how our thoughts limit our inner senses and obstruct psychologically our blossoming in order to let go the inner tensions and obstacles. The forces that come from our higher self are the ones that bring about a, a flow towards inner evolution situations come to us in order to be able to develop good actions and learn to see what is right and wrong. Then of course our personality interferes and we must find out how, to, how we react, why we react and finally find a way to not react. This whole process of awakening comes from our higher consciousness and therefore the path has to be treaded. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much. Uh, Vipin, um, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, you know, the part of the world we live in, we have hunter-gatherers, we have pastoralists, we have agriculturalists, and now even the IT specialists. So to me, I have a view of going back hundreds of thousands of years when I come across the people in my country and what is their inner thinking. And sometimes, you know, it is so different because sometimes we employ or come across people who are from a pastoralist community. And, and, you know, they are as much spiritual as anybody else. They have same needs. They want certain things in life as everybody else, but their approach is completely different from ours. And sometimes we find it amazing that the way they look towards the world is very different from the way we look towards. They, for them, money does not carry the same connotations as it carries for us. It is a, it is a mere tool. Uh, you see, environmental concerns, they seem to have a more in-depth understanding of their environment than we have. They portray the structure of the land and the trees and what is in it very differently from us. And 
so they have their way of life we have our way of life we have all come over a long period of some of us have moved towards uh, industrialization and the to modern technology but the inner conflicts i see in all of us from the hunter gatherers to the pastoralists to the agriculturists is almost similar so you know this has been a challenge for mankind for centuries to how to overcome this inner conflicts and uh, really i i i get really amazed at times at the thinking of these people and approach of the of these people but the problem remains the same for all of us yeah indeed yes indeed very fine uh, also some very interesting ideas vipin specifically on the different position of certain towards money and <laughs> towards mm -hmm. the environment and all very mm -hmm. interesting indeed thank you now um in connection with our theme living in the now challenges of the inner life we also had a second question namely this one knowing the importance that is given to an altruistic lifestyle in all wisdom traditions what is the correlation between that altruistic lifestyle and the living in the now in other words what does ethics have to do with living in the now and i would like to invite patricia to give us her views on this question well an altruistic lifestyle this service for the benefit of all beings uh, distances us for, from our little self and therefore from fails identifications. So our action in the present acquires a value that is the key for the connection with the universal, a kind of awakening to a new existence, um, a perfect attunement with the moment, with the here and now, the hic et nunc of the latings, an active uh, uh, non-judgmental presence beyond any limitation, because, uh, because we are the vast place in which everything happens. And uh, if we live in the here and now, we live, uh, we live a sense of a powerful presence within which it is impossible to act against or not in harmony with the law. That law which is compassion, which is universal love, and therefore altruism, brotherhood, generosity, gifts, ethics. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, there are uh, definitely a few very interesting things, uh, elements there that uh, maybe Diana could be tuning into. Diana, please. Um, living uh, in the now, being aware, uh, requires much awareness. Mm -hmm. um, the awareness of what happens in ourselves. Once one becomes more aware of how our personality plays around and does not want to give up its habits and so on, we can start to give attention to another way of looking at things, seeing what is happening around us, becoming aware that there is much need everywhere. Then one can start to offer help to others who are suffering and who are in need as well physically as psychologically. A kind word at the right time can do so much good. As one becomes more sensitive through inner growth, one can be more effective with offering help in daily life. Thank you, Diana. 
That is a very powerful thing you, you said there, the kind word at the right moment. It yes. indeed is something like a, a, a miracle thing. <laughs> yes. it, because it also requires us to recognize yes, at to, the right moment yes. what exactly to do, to be of help, of true help to, to the others. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Diana. Maria João, would you like to uh, add... Uh, to what we, we just heard. I have been um, working for the past 30 years uh, in, with industry, with environment, with uh, Portuguese and uh, um, European authorities. And I have uh, witnessed um, some changes, some changes that give me hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most of the legislation that has been produced uh, over 30 years, let, let me say, has been centered, self-centered in men. Even when we have laws that are aimed to protect forests, the, the, the environment, it has always um, a purpose to, um, to save it for us, for our needs, for our purposes, um, and um, not, not, it has not been seen in uh, as a value in itself but as how it can um, give us things that uh, we need medicine uh, wood uh, um, resources i have witnessed uh, in the, not not long ago but um, a very a, a difference in the approach the, um, this kind of uh, this kind of environment, this kind of um, uh, things, have been seen by the not in the perspective of what can, they can do for us, but in the right to exist. Animals have the right to exist because they are because what they are, not because they are good for us or they or we need them. Animals, forests, uh, the earth, the earth. I think the, the first time we went um, uh, outside the, the earth changed a perspective that we never had before during the, the, the during history. And I think that um, this change gives us hope that what is happening is not is not uh, um, in politics is is not uh, um, we don't think it's the best, but we can see a change when we have been working for the past thirty years, and that gives me um, a sense of hope. I think this is great to hear. This is great to hear. Thank you, Maria Joao. Now, this is very interesting because you have been working for a long time with policymakers, so to say. And Vipin has been working quite a while at the other end with the companies. <laughs> Vipin, mm. how would you react or contribute to what we just heard? Yes, you see, there is the policy creators and those who have to follow the policy. Yes. Now, what we have been seeing, what is emerging now is a close linkage between the two. Policies have to be respected because they are a part of our uh, structure to improve everything. For example, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. 30 years ago, in many professions, women were not welcome. It was a man's world. And gradually, it was enforced that you should have a certain number of women in your employment. And uh, 
they should rise to a level where their competency is is fully uh, exhibited. So we started employing women, and now we have almost 40 to 60 percent of women in many organizations. Mm -hmm. So similarly, according to the environmental conditions, that you have to be more environmentally conscious. That is being now driven more into the corporate world. So it, it is something which, you see, when it is right and when it is well focused and it's for the benefit of all, we see that there is no resentment against uh, policymakers and uh, people who have to carry out those policies. Yeah. So that change is a change which is very good. And I, it, we, have, we have still a lot of dark areas which we have to remove. Uh, there is still uh, a, I would say, a revulsion against these policies in many of our third world environment where people cut trees without permission. As you can see the forest behind me, we occasionally find people coming and chopping off trees. Okay. Now this is uh, a policy by the government not to allow rampant uh, removal of trees. And these people do this. And then we in the middle, when we just call the, the policy makers, they immediately come here and take action. So we, th this is working and we have to strengthen this mechanism that policymakers make policies and the people who have to follow it, they follow it thoroughly. Yeah. But all of that specifically because it is just the right thing to do and Correct. not 100% right to, to just so strictly follow the rules without yeah. the ethical connection. Correct. Yeah. Yes. I feel exactly the same. I feel exactly the same. This connection between a society, uh, lawmakers, and um, ethics is um, increasing, I think, and it is fundamental for our future. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Thank you. Um, no doubt we, we could still say a lot more, but we are only there at our second question and time is running fast, but that's okay because we have so far already heard a lot of interesting things. But still, a third question, which tries probably to extract the gist of the things that we have heard so far. What, in your view, is the most important challenge of the inner life of a human being today. And I would like to uh, invite Diana to uh, comment on that or to uh, share her views on that. The most important challenge of the inner life of all of us today, Diana. Uh, in this world, uh, great suffering is caused and endured by humanity physically and psychologically. Our lives are supposed to be a learning process by which we can proceed in our evolution. A great part of the population is not aware of this inward evolutionary path as explained in theosophy. The people who are aware of it, however, are having quite often a great struggle on how to manage with the probations that come along our way. Theoretically, things may be understood, but putting it into practice is a whole different matter. The suffering comes from friction and resistance, not accepting what comes on one's way wanting it to be different. Culturally, we have been raised by the pursuit of having fun, having a pleasant time, commodity, etc. So when there is suffering, it simply does not fit in. 
But as the law of karma is unquestionable, we just have to accept it earlier or later. Otherwise, personal confrontation will not end. Once one understands this completely, it can be a turning point where a total change of view can take place. And by embracing the difficulties that come on our way, they sort of melt away. Then problems won't be problems anymore. They really are opportunities to make progress, to see how far we can make it, to observe ourselves and to learn about our inner lives. Once we make a start, the path will become the path with capital letter. This whole process will take its time. Many lives may be needed. It cannot be done in a hurry. Every step has to be made firmly after serious inner exploration. So the sooner we start or restart, the better. Life has its rhythms. So things must flow in a natural way. But if we become aware, something new can arise. Thank you, Diana. And indeed, um, you lift up there this all important thing of our struggles. And also I heard the word suffering which has a very special thing about it. It's, it's more like a mystery, how out of something that you never would believe something good could come out of it, can indeed be transformed into kind of a stepping stone to make, even if it would be inwardly, in our inner life, to make a leap forward. Vipin, yes. what would be your views on that? Yes, a very interesting question. I would like to look at the inner challenges of my life and the inner challenges of my great-grandfather's life. Compare the two. In my great-grandfather's time, the external life was a very simple life. The requirements were to look after his family, feed his family, provide a housing for them and lead a very simple life. There were very few challenges of the kind uh, we have now. Although if the basics of the life were available, the life for them was very good. And they were not distracted by what we are from the, the amount of uh, noise in the form of everything, news and whatever did not exist in their days. So they led a much simpler life. I would say, although I have absolutely no contact with him, that his inner life was far more peaceful. Although there were drawbacks in their life in that the kind of medicine which we have today was not available to them. The, the availability of the vast uh, amount of food which we have was not available them to the to to them, but it, the quantity that that was required was there. Otherwise, I wouldn't be around here today. So, <laughs> so, and when I look at my life, what is the difference? The 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 external world, the external uh, things in the life, is really overstretched, far beyond what I would need. At the same time, the inner life is in a, uh, in a massive uh, uh, disruption in the, the, in the way that I, I, I cannot escape from the information age. Whatever happening is happening anywhere in the world is available to me. And it's, I have to live with all the negative news emerging from, from the planet. I have to live with my inner conflicts. The surroundings around me 
the the fast world which is deteriorated in so so quickly in terms of uh, keeping it uh, healthy these worries were not there in my great grandfather's days and uh, sometimes i wonder what's what's really going to happen to my children and to my grandchildren in this kind of environment are we really on the right track are we consuming the right nutrition it was nutrition was very easy for my uh, great grandparents they just ate what their parents ate we are open to a wide array of nutrition which may not be good for us so we have this inner conflicts in in our life every day the from from the moment we get up that look if i close myself to the rest of the world is also not not uh, being fair to myself in and not understanding the suffering of the the people all over the world so i cannot close myself from the media i cannot close myself from the destruction of the planet and this all inner conflicts act on me that what is my capacity in what way can i bring about a change and then i realize that whatever little capacity i have i must use it i must bring awareness to others and that's all i can do to make life better for the, the coming generations yeah. and uh, it's very debatable you know how we have come so far in the last 100 years that we live my grandfather would not be able to recognize the kind of life i am leading and whether he would want to live in this kind of life yeah. so similarly i don't know what the next 100 years are going to bring and what in a conflicts mm-hmm. though that, that is going to bring to the future generations yeah yeah so we have to think about we are entangled course. now but um on the other hand um out of that i would say it is quite clear what we have to do amongst others is to indeed prepare the new generations to deal with this kind of thing you mentioned just the the terrible information flow uh, a lot of information of which it is also quite difficult to know whether it is true or not it's quite a challenge in its in itself in its own right uh, maria jao Do, do you have something to to say to that or of everything that you heard so far yeah. because it was a very interesting thing to say look maybe we have more to learn from our predecessors from our ancestors than we actually sometimes dare to admit we have to understand we have to we cannot be apart from the world what is happening we cannot be apart from uh, our ancestors uh, legacy legacy we cannot be and and we, we must um, deep um, go inside our um, ancestors uh, way of living and their difficulties and also their strengths so to learn and we have to learn with other um, other people um it was mentioned uh, that people have different ways of uh, looking at things and that, that is so important to to understand that diversity is our strength and not our weakness um I think the the inner challenge that I face the most is to find the inner silence inside myself so that I can focus on um what can I understand of myself what can I understand of the world and to act according to that I think that my that is my most <laughs> my biggest challenge yeah. <laughs> nowadays <laughs> <laughs> and uh, patricia what uh, what would you say to that 
Well, I think that, uh, as already mentioned, self-awareness in this world of a million stimuli, which continually takes us out of ourselves, is the great challenge of this time. Yeah. Because it is continually necessary to discern what can make the difference for, for our spiritual life from what distances us from our interiority. So self-awareness, awareness, generally speaking, and self-awareness, as already said, I would yeah, stress. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and definitely not to forget about the fact that maybe the real progress is actually um, in the inner life and the path that we tread, also reconnecting with uh, what Diana said, and not as much to be too much outwardly oriented, yeah, but to also take the necessary time to go inside. And actually, um, this brings us to another very interesting question, namely, has meditation or prayer a role in the now challenge and in the challenge of living in the now? And I would want to go back first to Maria Zhao. Meditation and prayer. It helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it helps a lot to, to find that silence that I was mentioning before because we need to stop. We need to, to center ourselves. We need to sometimes to be in the middle of the, the, the flowing uh, the, uh, around us, but if we do not center, um, we get lost. Yeah. Uh, and meditation um, and in prayer, in the sense that uh, Theosophy defines it with um, a prayer in um, talking, uh, uh, an inner talking with us, yeah. ourselves and uh, with uh, the, the universal um, uh, uh, strengths, is so important to achieve this. Yeah. And of course, there are a lot of methodologies and luckily, uh, Theosophy also recognizes many methods and recognizes, as you said earlier, the diversity and therefore the necessity of having different uh, paths for recollection, for meditation, for, for inner discipline also. Patricia, could you, could you perhaps share your views on this? Well, uh, uh, living in the present moment uh, means uh, being totally there completely present to, to ourself uh, means uh, living immersed in the here and now. And prayer and meditation help us to improve this practice because they are effective, they are successful only under these precise conditions. And thus they open us the doors of immensity. They open us to the immeasurable and uh, I would like to quote uh, Rumi words. Oh, the yes. Words. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They say, past and future veil God from our sight. Burn up both of them with fire. I think there is nothing more to add. Okay. Thank you, Patricia, for this very fine Rumi quote as well. Diana, would you... Uh, would you see to add something to complement something on what we already heard? Um, meditation is in the, uh, the way to a more conscious awareness and inner unfoldment and therefore an increasing presence in the now. Therefore, uh, the practice of meditation can lead to human regeneration if it is done seriously 
The faculty of concentration can be developed over time to focus our minds on inner objects and ideals. The more this is accomplished, the background of the mind can be of a different nature, a higher nature, and it can color our lives through higher, higher thoughts, elevated emotions and uh, generous actions. If we understand meditation as a state of being, then we could try and look within purposefully at an, any spare time while going for a walk, while waiting for an appointment and so on. We can make it our inner duty to watch for every single opportunity to be helpful by growing in inner realization. Indeed. And I hear you uh, talk about this concept, uh, which Radha Bernier has extensively talked about, and she even wrote a book about it, namely human regeneration. And probably still other international presidents have, uh, have indeed uh, tried to convey this idea of human regeneration, in which I believe that the living in the now um, or maybe you could call it, if you want to, to say it in that terms, continuous prayer plays a very important part. Now, um, Vipin, meditation and prayer. And out of your experience, your African experience, how, what does that yes. give? Uh, yes, my... African experience is very unique. You know, when I was young and I was traveling a lot around, I used to see some people sitting at a spot. And when I come back after several hours, he's still on the same spot, same, still viewing the same thing. And I, I at that, that time, of course, I was wondering, hasn't this person got anything better to do? That he says, sits several hours like this. Now at this age, I realize that what has happened is nature has enchanted the person. He has given himself to nature for hours. He doesn't need anything else that he can live so pleasantly, so quietly and experience the nature. And then I, when I began to understand what is meditation, and what are prayers? And I said, look, this is a human necessity through the ages that human beings had to meditate, had to pray. Because when you want to be with nature, this is a requirement that you, you surrender to nature. And I found that this is happening where I am, in, I am entangled with the, my daily existence. These very people with very little as their possession live in the now with nature. And then it made me wonder what is it that gives them such massive comfort in life? And that I think this is a, a, a human precondition that you go into this state, you have no choice. Either you meditate or you live in a entangled world. So meditation is a necessity and one must surrender to nature to really get into meditation. Now, that's a very important thing you say there. Uh, we recall from earlier uh, international conventions from uh, the, 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 the keynote of our international president, Tim Boyd, that, that at some point in time he said, look, it's probably something that passed just unnoticed by the most of us, but actually uh, humanity has come to a point where there are much more people living in cities than in a rural area. Yes. So this means that a growing number of people has probably not the contact with nature, nature. to actually be immersed by yes. it. 
now I see there a new a new inner challenge. <laughs> mm, yes. Except that, it, if you could connect with the plant on your balcony, of course, but then you need a plant on your balcony. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. That, that's just the beginning. But when you when you begin to feel that nature is an extension of you, mm. yeah. that is the truly a stage of meditation. Yeah. Beginning of meditation. Yeah. And it's not a one way thing, it's a two way thing. Yes. It's a two way connection. Yes. Really. Yeah. You see, our urbanization leads to destruction of nature. And that is one of the main reasons why we have all the problems now. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Pippin. And um, dear friends and dear all, I see that we have come to uh, more or less the end of our um, time allocated to us so it is uh, i guess time to thank the panelists for all their ideas and their valued contributions to this discussion uh, and i hope that we have given the audience a few things to chew on and to deepen their own experience uh, in the inner life and for the living in the now and of course um, we also thank the audience, we five of us, for having tuned in on this part of the program of the International Convention of the Theosophical uh, Society. Most importantly, we urge the audience not to go yet because it's not yet finished. Uh, we will, in a while, continue with a short video of some beautiful TS premises in Europe and in Africa. And after that, uh, we will be very glad to welcome Antonio Girardi to share his reflections on one of his preferred books on theosophy, namely The Voice of the Silence. We see you in a moment. <laughs>